that would be helpful. Thank you. The first item are minutes of the Recreation, Sports and Culture Standing Committee meeting held on Monday, October 3rd, 25th, and the recommendation is that the committee approve those minutes. Move. Second. On there. All in favor? Unanimous. The next item is a delegation from Mr. Alexander Bell regarding the Coquitlam Crunch Challenge Embracing Diversity, and I'll just ask Mr. Bell to come up to the podium. Is that? Welcome, Mr. Bell. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for giving me the time. And, and if you could just uh, state your name for the record. That would be great. My name is Alexander Bell, not Graham. Charles. <laughs> and, and your address is? My address is number 16, 1170 Lansdowne Drive in Coquitlam. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'm here today to talk about is that uh, on August 29th of this year, I endeavored to go up the, uh, the Coquitlam Crunch 10 times in one day in order to raise money for diversity, uh, to, to build a diversity fund for our community. Uh, and uh, it was a wonderfully successful uh, opportunity. Um, in fact, some people here donated, and thank you very much. Um, and what I'm here today to uh, is basically to talk to uh, the city to ask for a s uh, official, basically, uh, support and a partnership to actually have this become an annual event in the community of Coquitlam in order to raise money for a diversity fund that will be held by the Coquitlam Foundation uh, in order to uh, basically fund uh, any diversity initiative in the community of uh, Coquitlam uh, on an ongoing basis in a way that uh, allows us to build capacity for diversity initiatives uh, in a way that doesn't necessarily drain the tax budget because I know cities are being downloaded all the time. And so what I thought is, geez, if we can actually create a fund that over time gets built up and then can be controlled by the community, for the community, for diversity initiatives, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? And just to give you a little bit of background in that, um, I've got some information on the Coquitlam Foundation, which I'm sure many of you are uh, quite aware of, and they are part of the partnership. They, they hold the diversity fund. Um, I also did this for a program called uh, Safe Harbor. And this is a program uh, that's sponsored by the uh, provincial government, uh, Welcome BC, that uh, in encourages diversity awareness in uh, agencies and in businesses. And I am the uh, coordinator of the Tri-Cities, uh, and I deliver these workshops for free for any business agency or local government who mm -hmm. chooses to sign on to be a safe harbor, which I'm also willing to do for the city of Coquitlam, all for free. Um, in, in Safe Harbor, what they have, uh, because the question comes up is, what do you mean by diversity? What, what, is, what does that include? And the wonderful thing I like about supporting diversity is that it is such a diverse group that it encompasses uh, just about everybody in the community. Under Safe Harbor, they have eight different uh, categories that includes diversity. Uh, one is uh, culture, gender, uh, respect for all abilities, so that's about physical disabilities as well. Uh, respect for all religions, respect for all ethnicities, respect for all sexual orientations, respect for all socioeconomic status, and respect for all ages. So as you can see by those eight categories, it really basically includes almost everybody. I, I can't necessarily fit into a nice comfortable category here, but uh, just about uh, many other people in the community can. The other thing about the idea of creating an annual fundraiser that goes up the Coquitlam Crunch is I think it's an excellent opportunity to promote health in our community, to promote a natural asset that we have in our community, and it's a way of being able to bring the community together in a way that really, I, I, I don't know if we have an event like this of our, that we can call our own in the community to create a, a fundraiser like this. It may also have the opportunity to pull in people from uh, surrounding communities that may also want to uh, uh, do the Coquitlam Crunch Challenge. And there's many ways of doing that uh, challenge. And that could be a way of actually bringing money into our community as well to support diversity initiatives. So this is my dream. I'd like to make it an annual event with the support of the city. And uh, that's what I'm here to ask you for. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Powell. How long did uh, going up and down 10 times take you? 12 hours. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Good on you. Yeah. Good I on think you. I hold the record. I don't know if anybody else, why anybody else would want to do it more than that. <laughs> no, no it's, it's, you've got a very, uh, uh, this is a very intriguing idea. Thank you for bringing it forward. Lena. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alex. It's. Um, 12 hours of the crunch, that's pretty impressive. Um, I'm wondering if, I have a couple questions. When you say support of the city, what do you mean? Like, I, I, if you could be a bit more specific. Excellent question. <laughs> what, basically what I'm looking for is really to establish a sort of broad-based uh, committee that will uh, help pull this together. And uh, the best way of uh, really gaining official status to do this is really having official representation in this, uh, in, from the city. So I'd like somebody from, say, recreation or is in, in a department to actually be able to sit as part of the committee and be part of the committee so that there's official, because it will impact this, uh, the city in different ways. And so having somebody officially representing could also deal with some of those details that will come up if we have people crossing city streets, how will we deal with that, all those sorts of things that uh, will need to be dealt with through the city in order to do this on a large scale. So from an organizational basis, in terms of putting it together, yeah. you, you just want a city rep, that you would have a volunteer committee that would be responsible for putting it all together, but you want the city represented at that table to address some of the issues that they may be able to manage or handle or... Exactly. Yes. Thank you. That, that was one question. Um, the other question, you, you talked about Safe Harbor yes. and that it's free. Um, and I, I'm interested, I'd like to check with our staff, is that something that we would be interested in or have, has there been any uptake from our staff? I know that we're doing a whole customer service <coughs> stuff and if Safe Harbor had been considered a part of the, uh, the training. Uh, through the chair, yes, the um, city has looked at the Safe Harbor uh, program and, of course, uh, believes in uh, the principles of access and equity that uh, are evident in that program. We haven't uh, signed on to it in a formal way, but all of our facilities are welcomed refuge uh, places for all members of the community for all of the operating hours that uh, we're operating. But I understand that the specific signing on to this specific branded program has previously been considered by uh, council and the decision at that point was not to um, participate in this particular program, but to continue to have our facilities available to all members of our community during our operating hours. I may, I may want to take a look at this program and bring the conversation back, but that, that's fine for now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good idea. I'm wondering if we can get a report from Parks and Recreation, Mr. Chair, to see how many other organizations would be facing the same thing. If we were to approve this one, would we have another 20, 30 organizations that say, this is what we want City of Coquitlam to endorse? and become, th that's a dangerous part about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, although a lot of good, mm -hmm. what you're bringing up is a very good idea. But again, I'd like to have Parks and Recreation give us a report to see where we fit in, how does the city fit in, and how many more requests would we have in the course of a year, okay? All right, okay. Have any answers to that? Well, yeah, we'll, why don't we go around sure. here and then we'll get some direction sure. here afterwards. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Thanks. Hi, Alex. Nice hey. to see you. Um, I like this. I want you to know I do the crunch from Guilford to Lansdowne. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a fairly Very good. long way. Yeah. <laughs> no, it goes, I don't mean on the corner. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they think I do is walk the corner. The part it, where you can drive your car through there. No, <laughs> exactly. The dogs and I do it. Anyhow, never got any higher. It would kill me. Um, what time of year are you thinking of doing this? Oh, that's another good question. Um, this year I did it uh, August 29th, looking, trying to figure aware, out, because yeah. it, it really comes down to what other events are happening. Uh, I don't want to compete with things like the Terry Fox run that we've oh, taken you, on this year. You've got and stuff. my attention now. So, uh, yes. one of the things we are doing is we've had a couple of um, feeder years into doing a July 1st celebration. We've always sort of over the years stayed out of it because our neighbors have done it, but we had more and more requests, so we've sort of jumped into it. And 
one of the things, and when you say diversity, one of the things that's been really important um, with Councillor McDonnell, I know, and, and Lori, because we've had a few conversations, is on the July 1st event, having um, the ethnic diversity with uh, bringing their foods and customs and things like that and making July 1st a big day. But there's nothing to say that that couldn't be spun off into your run the following day or the day before and do an awards thing. It's a different diversity. It is diversity. And as you say, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you really define diversity? But what I'm thinking is one of the things that the city could do is try and hook it to July 1st before or after, which would give, we could, you could do, um, give out the medals the following day or just give it lots of PR on the day and have it on the second. So I like the idea. I think it's really cool. And I'm glad you're going to be doing it. And there's no need for council to follow, right? Well, you could be considered a diversity group if you want it. <laughs> no, I meant to run up the hill. <laughs> okay, so that that's uh, something I, I agree we should look into. I do agree with Councillor Sikora, though. But um, I could sure see that as a tag on somehow. Thank you. Thank you. Anna? Thank you. Um, and thank you very much. Your, uh, you did a presentation to our Multicultural Advisory Committee last That's correct. And I'm sure that there's great support by Councillor Sikora and by all of Council to. Uh, uh, to move on that and also your uh, crunch challenge. Um, so I would uh, certainly be interested. I'm not sure exactly how we will do that, um, whether it will be through committee or, or whatever, but um, I would certainly be in support of that. And thank you very much for coming forward today um, with this request. I think it's a, a great idea and uh, it really will get the community uh, together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alex. It's, uh, I'm jumping in there too. It's uh, something that I think that in Coquitlam is highly under used and, and under-celebrated uh, our Coquitlam Crunch. So if it's okay with the rest of this committee, what I would do is uh, direct uh, our general manager, Lori McKay, if, if you could get together with her sometime and then you could get back to us and, and give us your uh, thoughts on the matter. Would that be? Or whoever your designate is to, to, to look into this? Uh, if I if I may, uh, staff would be delighted to work um, with you on this event. Um, certainly, the city does um, endorse a lot of these kinds of events, and we're happy to see this uh, new idea come forward. Um, and it is uh, Linda Baker of our office who works with groups such as yourself to um, have successful events, and they can certainly work with you on all those technical aspects that you're concerned about to make sure that it it operates uh, seamlessly around street crossings or any other uh, technical issues there. Um, certainly if the um, city were to issue a license for the event, that would represent that sort of sanctioning I think that you're looking for. So staff would be pleased to follow up directly um, with the delegate um, t for the planning of a 2011 event. Thank you, and thank you very much for presenting. It's a good on you for, for uh, pursuing this, and if you could leave your information with uh, Ms. McKay, uh, she could get it to the appropriate staff person, and then we can see where, where this will go. Okay, thank you very much, and thank, thank you for you. your time. Thank you. Next item is a delegation from Mr. Chris Wilson, Vice President of Coquitlam Sports Centre User Association in relation to the Poirier Sports Centre curling facility stairwell. I'll ask for Mr. Wilson to come forward. Welcome, Chris. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Your name and address for the record? Uh, Chris Wilson. My address is 630 Hillcrest Street. In and congratulations on being uh, inducted into Coquitlam's Hall of Fame on our very first uh, go around. Thank you very uh, much. Kudos to you for that. Well, thanks, and thanks for supporting the Hall of Fame. I think it's a real asset to the community. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So Michelle's just handing out the uh, uh, sort of a uh, 
follow-up to our presentation here. I just want to start by thanking you for your time today and also for all the work you did and the support you gave to the Fourier Sport and Leisure Complex. It's, uh, it's a great facility and I know it'll make, uh, make a real difference in our community, especially for young people. And, and uh, we really appreciate your, your efforts there and also the uh, efforts of the city in making sure that none of our seasons really became affected through the, through the construction. So uh, I know it was very difficult and it's much appreciated. Um, now like every re renovation, there's always loose ends and deficiencies to, uh, to tie up at the end and we're starting to, to work on some of those with, uh, with the staff. Um, but also like many renovations, there, there are some things that get overlooked in the plans. Sometimes they're not planned at all, other times they might be, have been misinterpreted in the plans and, and we believe that this is what happened with the, with the staircase on the south side of the building near, near the curling rink and that's what our presentation is about. Um, during the design process, another num number of the members of the Coquitlam Sports Center User Association were, were part of the design committee and we really appreciated being involved in that and, and asked to participate. And then towards the end of the design process, we were all asked to look at the plans and, and kind of sign off on, on behalf of our organizations. And I remember looking at those drawings about almost four years ago, three years ago, and uh, I was extremely excited at, at the plan, and, and we all were. Uh, unfortunately, most of us had no experience in reading architectural drawings, <laughs> and uh, um, a few things seem to have been missed. And, and I think uh, in this case, it was the direct access from the curling rink to, to the upstairs of the building. Um, and as you see on, on your screens, that this is the current um, uh, format for, for the exit and, and the entrance. Oh, sorry, it's not an entrance, they're, they're both exit doors. And I think when we were looking at the drawings, we just assumed that um, where there's the wall, between the two doors, there would have been access. Um, ideally, if we had had time to sort of magnify each part of the drawing and had the time to really go through it with a fine tooth comb, I think somebody might have picked up on, on this oversight, but nobody did. And uh, as well, because during the construction process, nobody um, had access to the the bottom part of the facility while it was being built. Nobody picked up on it until um, the Curling Association uh, started using the, the uh, building. And that's when it was first noticed that there was no direct access from the curling rink to the upstairs. Our association uh, unanimously feels that, that this is, is one of the very few design deficiencies in the building and, uh, and we're asking that it be rectified. Uh, because there's no direct access, whenever there's a social event upstairs, uh, people need to walk three times as far um, to get to the upstairs. And we actually pace this off, and, and it is three times as far. Not that that's the end of the world, but it, it's, uh, it's not very convenient. The last time the Curling Association hosted a major bond spiel, um, the feedback was that the building was great, the food service was great, um, but the access to the social area was awful. Uh, because there's a lot of going back and forth during an event, um, you know, uh, the access is, is, uh, is an important issue. And what seemed to be a minor issue on the surface is actually uh, a little bit larger of an issue and could have an impact on drawing for further events to the curling uh, rink. And, and on a personal note, a couple weeks ago we had a very successful uh, kids sport curling bond spiel that the city uh, also helped with. and. Uh, I was part of the organizing crew for that and, and I actually saw how inconvenient it was to actually have to go all the way around every time we, we uh, had to go upstairs, which we had to do about 10 times during the evening. Uh, there's a lot of frustration among the members of the Curling Association and uh, one of the concerns is that this frustration may lead to, to losing some members. And I know uh, one of the suggestions was to, to wait for a year and see how everything worked out, but one of the concerns of the Curling Association is that by waiting for a year, they may actually lose some members. So our association put together a task force, the, the Sports Center Association put together a task force to try to come up with a solution. And uh, at our last meeting, the members of our association voted unanimously for the solution that we're proposing and, and to, uh, to rectify the situation. 
Uh, so Michelle <coughs> Lamoth, who represents uh, the Coquitlam Skating Club, is just going to talk you through a little bit about the, uh, the proposal, and then we'll finish up. Michelle, I'm sorry, could you speak into the mic, oh, please? Sorry. So what we're trying to do is combine the two doors into one new exit. So I have a slide here. Do you have the hand held? Or she's not. Now we get the idea. Um, if you look at your handout, <laughs> something has happened and it lost. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Presentations. <laughs> Don't <laughs> worry about it. Nothing ever goes wrong for us any other time. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Sure. Um, so basically, if you if you check your handout, please. Um, what we're proposing to do is to uh, extend the exit with the new vestibule. And the vestibule would be made out of the same materials that the existing facility now is uh, constructed of. So we would have uh, a safety glass. But in this case, on the vestibule, we would look at putting a, a shaded uh, glazing tinted because we don't want this to become another entrance. Basically, it's still being maintained as an exit. So with the tinted glazing, then um, people can't you know, see through as, as easily. And um, I think one of the problems now that we're having too is on the existing curling exit, because there is a glazing panel there, what happens is that people walk by and if there's people in that curling space, they're banging on the door because they want to be let in. So this will also help um, so that we won't have people trying to use this as a main entrance. And um, on this particular example, we have put um, a, just a sloped uh, safety glass uh, roof on there and uh, we do need the two doors uh, one door is basically replacing the doorway that goes to the upstairs so we take out the interior door and the second door is exactly um, in front of the exit that is now uh, for the curling so we need the two means of egress and by using more of a storefront design uh, we we'll, we'd be able to um, put this right onto the concrete sidewalk. There would be very little work because there's only about a foot or two that the sidewalk would have to be extended on the left-hand side of the um, exit. And um, it would comply with all the building codes. We've uh, already been down to the building department and reviewed this. And this would make um, you know, a, a, a new connection and uh, the door to the curling rink would not have to be locked anymore because these two exterior doors would be locked from the outside and they would have the panic bars for egress on the inside. And I would have loved to have shown you um, how I could take you on a, a, a view from, from the top down so you could actually see how everything worked, but for some reason, uh, I don't know what's happened to my computer. Okay. 
So we've uh, received two estimates for this proposal uh, from independent contractors of between $28,000 and $32,000. Um, as Michelle said, it keeps the look of the building consistent, it meets the building code requirements, provide direct access, direct access to the, the top floor uh, from the curling rink. It'll keep the safety and the integrity of the building uh, intact and will make the building work much better. Um, so we believe it's a, it's a small investment to make in, in the future of the building because it is such a great building. And, and like we said, we think this is one of the very few deficiencies in design. Um, everyone involved in the construction and renovation of this building should be proud of the job they did and the fact that it was done under budget and ahead of schedule. And as taxpayers, we're quite excited about that as well. Um, but I think part of uh, coming under budget meant that they had to keep the design changes to a minimum and, and, and um, unfortunately this wasn't uh, caught in time to, uh, to rectify during the construction. All members of our association feel that it was an oversight in the design and um, we respectfully request that uh, your committee uh, supports our proposal and helps us uh, make this change. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Thank you. Have some questions here, Lou? Thank you very much, uh, Chair. <clears throat> so you're saying to build this stair would be twenty-eight to 32000 uh, To make the enclosure, yeah. Okay. Uh, where was this figure that has been banting around about 200000 that I've heard the last few months? Yeah, there's a figure from Parks and Recreation or somebody in a city that said this would cost 200000 to renovate it. Uh, through the chair, I can ask Frank Cormack from our strategic initiatives department. Uh, they had reviewed a number of options previously that had a variety of different uh, costs associated with it. And uh, if the chair um, requests, we can have uh, Mr. Cormack respond. Yeah, to be fair to Mr. Cormack, uh, have you seen these? Uh, have you seen this yet? No. So it's pretty unfair to put you in this position here. And before before we uh, make any decisions here, we would need to see a staff report. However, uh, we'll be asking you questions here today before we put this forward to mm -hmm. staff to, to review. Can I, can I just add one little thing? We, we actually worked quite a bit on the design and Michelle went to, to the building department uh, with the city a few times just to you know, make sure that it complied with, with the Oh, well, I'm sure that, I'm sure it's all above board I think, and everything. I think when it was initially um, talked about um, those were all rough estimates, and I think by working through the process, we were able to, to get something that would work. Yeah, I think another thing, you know, uh, I hate to say this, but you know, you're c quite correct when you said, you know, we uh, probably overlooked it and a few other things, the blueprints, and if you look, I'll tell you what, in that fact, like many other people with blueprints, they're amateurs. You and your professional life are, are very professional and, and everything else, but reading blueprints, you may be an amateur like I am. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I think that's that's the problem that we had in this case. Uh, also, that I, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, we're under budget on this thing, so I think that this should be accommodated. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Chris, I just want to confirm what I, I think is really significant in the proposal, which is that it comes from the entire sports center user group. It's not a curling proposal. It's everybody's in agreement. Yes, uh, definitely. We had a, a, in our last meeting, we, we discussed the proposal at length. We've discussed this at almost every meeting for the last year. Um, and and the, the association had a vote and it was unanimous to, uh, push for this proposal. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Barry? Well, thanks, yeah, very comprehensive report uh, yet answered most of my questions. I think the cost is certainly much more reasonable than we've anticipated coming forward and heard about in the past. If I heard correctly, you said not only the building code issues, but also the fire department have been satisfied. I don't recall, I know there were some building um, requirements when we first were looking at the plans and the fire department had some exit plans and requirements, and I want to make sure that that's been covered off. Did you address that or was it just building code? I'll let Michelle answer that question. Okay. We didn't go to the fire commissioner, but I did go to the um, building department and reviewed it uh, twice with them. 
And um, from the code review, basically what we're doing is we are extending the um, envelope of the building, but we're not affecting the, the envelope itself. And so that was one of the reasons that we were able to have um, uh, a storefront where there's glazing because it's not um, impeding the limiting distance. And also we are not changing the exiting itself. Um, we haven't changed the, um, the width of egress because the doors on the exterior are still the same width as the um, doors on the building envelope. And um, within the, the vestibule itself, we would still have sprinklers and emergency lighting, and there would also be um, a fire bell so that it would be uh, connected to the rest of the building. Okay, thank you, and Mr. Chair. I'm sure that will be in the report coming from staff. The last concern I had, I guess, this is probably through to staff, is it was, you mentioned briefly about the possibility of it being used as a main entrance or people open the door open stuff. I know that that was a concern at one point with the design, and I'm, I'm guessing the staff is probably gonna address that in the report, but I, do you have any preliminary comment on that? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, certainly staff uh, can review this proposal from a technical perspective on the building side, but we also need to be mindful of the operating impacts as well. And so our review would include uh, any operating impacts. Uh, the one that uh, was uh, top of mind for council when we reviewed the earlier options were the additional cost for uh, supervision yeah. um, because we currently don't have hall supervisors um, monitoring people going upstairs um, without having the supervision of going through the main control center. Um, so we'll certainly look at um, whether it would drive any additional um, supervision of the building for security reasons as well as any impacts on utility costs or other operating costs. But those would all be covered off in a comprehensive report from staff. So, so at first blush, uh, you know, in this price range and addressing these concerns, I'd like to see somehow if we can make this happen, but we'll wait for the report. Thank you. Sure. Um, Richard? I think it was her first. Yeah. Meeting members, go first. Go oh, ahead. of course. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm like-minded. I appreciate the amount, amount of work that's gone into this, um, and I do want to make sure that the operational uh, issues are taken care of. My comment is mostly related to the process that got us here, because um, two years ago, we broke ground on a building, um, and I wanna make sure that in future, we are trying to, as much as we can to facilitate a better dialogue, if, if possible, or a better, uh, perhaps a, a, you know, we, for example, in, the, in some ways, we may want to look at vi uh, video versions of, of blueprints more than we have in the past and try to understand a little bit more how you can do video walkthroughs of buildings so that user groups who aren't professional plan reviewers can have a, have a good look at how the building works in practice before we break ground. Um, uh, I think that we owe it to user groups to make sure that we get their input, not just on blueprints, but not just on the two-dimensional form, but in a three-dimensional view and actually walk through the building long before we build it. Uh, to try to try to catch these things. It's it's something that um, that I have witnessed myself, and you try to get from the lower floor up to the upper floor, or, or vice versa, uh, on the curling end, and it is it is a long walk. And uh, so I I, I certainly want, I'm looking forward to seeing the staff report as to how this particular option works. I note that the uh, the drawing before us has a couple of mistakes because that's it's not meant to be a, a definitive drawing. I want to see how those those details get, get caught in the, uh, in the detailed review and uh, let's, let's see if we can move forward with this. So thank you. Thank you. Linda? Thank you. Um, I, I too agree when you're looking at plans and you're looking at page two which has the upper floor and page one that has the lower floor, you're not really looking at the connection between the two. So I, I can easily understand how something like this was missed. Um, I, I think that this is an excellent idea and concept. Um, the, the price is much less than, than what we thought it was going to be. And so I'm looking forward to uh, receiving the staff report. A um, question for staff, uh, if I could, when might that report be forthcoming? Uh, staff would look to schedule that report early in the new year. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I just would like to remind everyone that these 
costs are preliminary and nothing that our staff haven't gone over yet. So <coughs> while they look hopeful, mm -hmm. uh, certainly nothing's written in stone. May, did you want to? Yeah, I did. Um, these doors, they have to be, the door, the outside door, the one exit is there for, for um, fire reasons and yeah. Because I have to say when I left the uh, function the other night, there were kids playing. I just sort of walked out. I guess I'd be on the north side of the building. There was an exit door there and there were kids <coughs> just having a ball, shutting people out and pushing them out the door and things like that. And those doors are heavy, one arm and that. You're gonna be less one arm. Um, so we have to keep this door as an exit door, that's correct? Okay, so that's why you came up with this idea. So you don't affect the integ integrity of the building, you're just adding this on. In fact, we believe it's actually uh, better than the current um, situation because the glass would be tinted, so you can't actually see inside. So... Um, but would you, can you exit those doors? Um, in, you, like the one that was used the other night, the kids were just going in and out of it. Is there any way that an exit door would only be triggered from the inside and for, for fire purposes or for emergency purposes? That's my question. Yeah, well just before we go too far down this, it, it, to be fair, staff have, haven't seen this proposal oh, okay. yet. And so rather than have um, misinformation go back and forth, I would much prefer no, that, our staff that, to that, That's good, to but that's a over. concern to me because I can see this just not being up to snuff, but I like the idea, brilliant, thank Thanks. you. Could Sorry I idea. just respond back to your question on the doors? Those doors, they would have panic bars inside. So a panic bar basically is a long bar, so an emergency, you push it. They don't have to have um, the ability to open from the exterior of the building. So if you just wanted to strictly keep them as an exit, um, that's all that you would be required to do. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, Ms. McKay, would it be you or Mr. Gravel that uh, this group would work with? Uh, this will be a joint report, so it'll be both um, Mr. Gravel and myself that will bring together a joint report for Council's uh, consideration in the new year. So, um, Mr. Wilson, if you would uh, be so kind as to um, hang around for a little bit, then we can get this information to our staff afterwards and we can get going on this. Sorry, Miss Lasbar. Your, in, we can, uh, if you, your information that you have, if you would like to wait till after the meeting and, and hand it off to Ms. McKay and Perfect, yeah. be able to. Glad to. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next. Item three is report of General Manager Parks, Recreation, and Culture Services related to the Mackin Park Master Plan Process Update Report. We have an introduction by our General Manager Parks, Recreation, and Culture Services, Lori McKay. Uh, thank you. Um, we have uh, before you the uh, concept plan for uh, Mackin Park, and I have asked uh, Andrew Mullen, our parks designer, who's been uh, the lead on this project, uh, to walk you through uh, the plan. We have a, a slide image of it uh, here. The, uh, this project began early in, in 2010, and we have been working with uh, the uh, community and with uh, internal departments uh, and technical experts to come up with a very exciting design for the future of Mackin Park. This is a long range plan for the park, and I'll ask Mr. Mullen if he could step up to the podium and walk you through the plan and respond to any questions that you may have. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, so um, I guess what I'll do is point out some of the um, design uh, elements that we have in the park in case there are any questions. Oh. This is, okay. I guess this will show up in your screen as well. Um, so um, we identified, uh, I think, it, uh, previous report, we had identified some of the constraints of the park, uh, the several right-of-ways, uh, there's some very steep areas, <laughs> and so in the design, one of the objectives was to make it universally accessible, and <laughs> for us that meant that all the parts of the parks would be accessible from all um, entries to the park. So <laughs> uh, currently, 
there's a 14.5% slope from the uh, northwest corner into the park, and all the pathways that we've uh, shown currently um, with a very faint um, uh, light line in the middle are under 5%. So it will greatly increase the ability for seniors and um, those who uh, are wheelchairs and walkers and such uh, to have access, access to the park. Um, some of the elements, um, all the sports fields are going to remain as they are. Uh, we have had, uh, we made a small adjustment to one baseball field in the lower um, the south uh, east corner uh, to accommodate the um, King Edward widening. Um, also as part of the King Edward widening, we have a, uh, we don't have a sidewalk on the um, curb side of uh, uh, King Edward. What we're doing instead is that we have um, a three meter walkway that uh, goes from the northeast uh, corner and uh, goes down by a new parking lot and then into the park uh, right down to the corner of the uh, Loheed and uh, King Edward. Um, this pathway will be lit and we're also proposing that there'll be a perimeter walkway that is uh, going to be paved as part of the King Edward project that will be lit around the perimeter of the park as well. Um, <coughs> again, uh, the, this parking lot, the new one off of King Edward, uh, will um, have a net gain of 16 parking spaces. They're replacing a small one that had eight spaces before, and we have um, 16 more on this one right now. And this is seen as the main vehicle access to the park. We'll have uh, a drop-off area for festival um, access for the shuttle buses. Um, and so all that's under construction. Uh, as we speak. Um, we also have a new element on the northeast corner which is the um, uh, artwork, the wind sails, and uh, it's located right now and as part of the um, development of the park there will be a plaza that will be built for that as well. Uh, one of the things that the Millardville Residents Association had requested through the preliminary process through the uh, interaction with them was that they wanted a promenade um, so we've provided that um, adjacent runs parallel with Brunette and um, we've also um, brought in a parterre gardens uh, which will be attractive areas that people can stroll through um, and uh, seating areas and that sort of um, helps us deal with the transition from this uh, um, there's uh, for the slopes in that area uh, so <coughs> many of the slopes right now that are grass will either be planting beds um, or uh, and there'll be a series of stairs and, and uh, ramps that take you down into the lower part of the park. Um, we've added um, the tennis courts will remain as they are. Before I'll, I'll go to the slide next slide in a moment but I also want to point out that all the way along the perimeter pathway we have a series of exercise stations and um, uh, these could be something like, uh, 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 they have them in Coquitlam right now, where it's our outdoor uh, it, uh, machines that uh, you can do all sorts of exercises with, or they might be something uh, simpler. That hasn't been quite decided yet. We also have um, on our, um, I believe it's in our OCP, that there's a, a potential for a, um, a new access path through the middle of the park from the west. Uh, when this area to the west is redeveloped. Now if we go to the next slide. So this is an enlargement of the um, part that we're going to be making most of the changes in. Uh, we are proposing to remove the small swimming pool and uh, replace it with a water play park. Um, we're also proposing a skate park. Um, we're a new concession building to replace the one that's uh, right now at the end of the um, baseball Mackin yard. Um, we've heard from the residents that they would like us to remove the um, picnic shelter because it was felt like it uh, attracted people that undesirables to uh, be in the park at night. Um, there's a very wild and um, 
area off to the side of the um, uh, picnic area that is, uh, we're going to get rid of the invasive plants in that area and make it a more attractive horticultural uh, display garden with uh, uh, some very interesting shrubs, uh, possibly a rhododendron garden. Um, as part of um, the barrier-free access then from the northeast would take us along the top, uh, along the promenade and down this slope through here and down around into the main plaza in the center. That's the length of um, pathway that we need to attain the under 5% slope to make the park accessible. Um, as part of <coughs> the regrading of the park, we end up with some walls along the top of the water play area and the um, children's play area. And those walls would be, <coughs> the children's play area will incorporate a climbing wall in that uh, area. And up above that would be a small plaza that uh, parents could um, overview their children playing. The wall in the water play area would be a, um, we would be able to put uh, water sprays in the wall as part of the, um, uh, the, uh, the fun and uh, for the children. What, uh, the water play is something that is only used at the most two and a half, three months a year. So we're looking at making it a multi-use uh, space. So it could also be used for festivals uh, in the off season, and we could potentially have uh, other sports uses, such as tetherball, or even use it as a basketball court in, when it's not being used for uh, the water play or the festivals. Uh, the skate park was something that uh, was quite controversial. Um, in our original um, concept that we had done, uh, it's a bubble diagram, we had shown it very close to Burnett Avenue that was. Uh, in quite a central location, basically where the park, park yard gardens are right now. And uh, it was felt like it was too prominent a location. Um, one of the things that both the users, the uh, skateboarders and the SEPT head uh, RCMP officer uh, told us is that we want to have high visibility and natural surveillance for the park. Um, and so this is the location we chose on, on those conditions and we've still try to pull it off to the side of, um, so that it's not a prominent central feature in the park. Um, I'll go back to the parking again. One of the things that currently there's a parking lot that goes basically into the middle of the park. And again, from our consultant process, it was uh, um, noted that it would be, that we're using very valuable park space for uh, a parking lot. So what we've done is we pulled back that parking lot and we reduced it from, I believe it's 28 spaces down to 11. But with the new parking lot on King Edward, uh, the spots that we have in this location and five more spaces we're at, um, adding mm -hmm. off of uh, Nelson, we'll actually have a net gain of four spaces. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Um, I think that pretty much covers most of it. The concession, I'll just go over that briefly. Uh, it's seen as a multi-use building. Um, uh, baseball now uh, has a concession, but through the a community advisory group, uh, they advised us that they would be quite willing to let that be shared with other community groups. And um, we see this building as functioning as a, um, a place where we can provide service for festivals. Uh, it could have refrigerators. It could be the source of um, electricity that they need. Uh, it's also, of course, a concession. Uh, it could have seasonal storage, and plus it would be the place where we'd uh, house the recirculating system for the water play park. Thank you. Um, the promenade there looks interesting along there because it'd be great for taking pictures. I got a lovely backdrop of a death's head right behind there, which I'm sure would be. <laughs> One of the things that uh, concerns me about uh, the redevelopment of this park is parking. Um, when you've got the two, when football's in play, you've got four teams playing, another four teams waiting, that's eight teams. Uh, each team has about 30 kids on a team. Uh, it, it was bad to begin with. And now, this parking over on King Edward is right in, right out only. Um, the thing about the sports 
baseball and football that use this, uh, a lot of people come from outside of Coquitlam to come here. It would be very hard to access this new um, new parking on King Edward by coming anywhere but from Coquitlam. And on the other side of it, <clears throat> we have uh, along Nelson, there's uh, some apartment buildings which use those parking spots, parkings at a premium down there. And I know you say that uh, you know net gain is four when we look at this, but with the, the people that do use it from the from the um, residents, I I would dispute that, and I think that parking is 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 an issue there now, and it will continue to be a bigger issue in the future if we don't address the parking on the street here. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, I've got the same concern. You know, you've got that baseball diamond that's uh, on uh, close to Brunette Avenue with a big parking lot there. That seems to have disappeared. Um, you go back to the last slide. Uh, no, we haven't taken any playing fields away at all. Are you referring I'm, to this one? All the, all the yeah. baseball fields that were there are there in the same location except for the one in the southeast corner, which is just rotated slightly. <coughs> The, the, uh, my concern is that we've redesigned this whole park and we have uh, moved things around and have lost some parking in through the whole process because you can redo a park like this, you get a lot more attention, a lot more people using it. And uh, uh, that, that's one concern that I do have. I, I have also concerns how we come about these prices in here, I've got great concerns. The, I don't know where we picked them from or who come up with those prices. The only time I'd suggest that, you know, we go for a proposal call down, we know we're exactly what the prices are gonna be. Because in one spot you have 1.6 million and another spot that we're gonna do the, the, the washrooms concession and water park, it'd be between two and three million. This whole range of from two million to three million, see? I'd like to have that a little lot tighter than what it is, and uh, to me, I don't know that we need to redesign a park and take everything away from there just to come up with a new design. Maybe some of the things that are there now should be left in place and utilize the uh, rest of the park for rebuilding it and, you know, maybe save some money to the taxpayers still have the same concept type of deal. So there's my concern, and Mr. Chair, I, I've got concerns with some of these things. It looks good, but also, you know, we forever and a day just keep ripping buildings down and putting up new buildings for uh, the budget is going to go up, and we have to be very, very careful in our budgets. Okay, so those are those are my concern. Parking is, uh, I think we're way short of the parking as it is now. Uh, we don't need to gain or lose uh, or lose any parking. We need to gain maybe 100, 150 parking spaces in the area. Thank you, Selena. Thank you. Um, I, I, um, in terms of the costing, I understand that next steps actually is to go ahead and take a look at some of these details. So we will get some tighter numbers. I just, I, I think it's important that we recognize that. Um, I want to compliment you on the challenges with this only green space for this entire area and trying to squeeze every little bit of activity that we can and acknowledge the challenges that, that comes with that, with everyone wanting their own little piece protected. Um, so I think you've done, I think, a stellar job in that respect. I would actually like uh, for this committee to uh, make a recommendation that the uh, Disabilities Advisory Committee also take a look at this. I appreciate that there's a, a universal design element to that, and I think it's important. But I've also learned that when you, um, that what we think is universally designed, even though we might use specific principles, that it isn't always the case. In fact, at the last meeting of the Disability Advisory Committee, I learned that even here in City Hall, that um, our washrooms are not fully accessible given that some people who have a care aid um, of an opposite gender um, have to go either in a male or female washroom and that we don't have one that they can go to that's just a standalone washroom. So we may think we're adhering to certain principles but aren't always, so I would really like to see, uh, it's particularly around the slopes and making sure that this committee also has a, can take a look and say yes, this is universally designed. Folks with um, certain challenges will will be fine. People who are visually impaired, etc., can uh, can make their way around around the park. Um, 
So that, that's the only piece that I would actually like to see as part of the next steps as well. Thank you. May? Thank you. Um, well, it, it's interesting, the um, lovely benches that you have up at Brunette being so close to the skate park. I hope we don't have them coming out of the skate park and trying to use, if, especially if they're concrete benches. I know you've thought of that, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing. The parking is an issue. But what concerns me more is the budget. And I will tell you, I, I just see red. And um, the mayor's not in the room, but we once had a washroom come to us for Hickey Park. And it was $470,000 for two potties. And I'm telling you, that's, those must be gold-plated toilets, because that was just really out of the ballpark. And again, we paid 800,000 for the concession building, 788, which is way out of the ballpark. And um, the spray park that the Kinsman helped us put in was around $400,000. So um, I don't know where this two or three million come from, but if we have to, I would sooner go out to private firms to come and do it than have the city do it, because at these prices, we can't afford to do anything in this city. So it's just absolute asinine. And the other thing, I would like to see us be bringing in the Kinsmen or Kiwanis or Rotary or whoever and asking them about them taking on building the skate park and the, um, and the uh, water park for the little ones and maybe even the gardens. I mean, we have lots of talented people in our community and maybe we can, you know, give part of that to them to do. My last question is for you. Somewhere on one of the things that was a bit bigger, all the gray, maybe you can go to the next slide, can you? That was it, yes. All this is pavers, is it? Um, this gray. Uh, no, 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 go over where the concession over is. Over this area? Yeah. Um, it is, uh, that's currently paved right now, um, but um, it, it's a fairly high activity area, um, plus it would be a place that we would use for uh, tents for the festivals as well. But yes, that's what's shown at the moment is it's all okay. pavers. And the parking on uh, Nelson Street there, yes, where right. you have all the green buffer, is it a buffer that's needed as a riparian buffer? Yes, it so is. So we yes. can't go into it anymore for more parking. That's correct. Okay. And my last probably dumb question, I've been down there enough, but are there two feet, two baseball fields on there now? You've got one there and one down in the corner now in the new plan. Are there two there now? Um, yeah, all the fields that are there are basically in the same uh, general so location. So there is that little one down at the bottom. There's okay. four baseball fields. There's four, four baseball fields. Yeah, I'm looking. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's good. But I meant this bottom right corner, that, so it is there. Yeah. It is, yes. Okay, thank you. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you. Barry? Okay, thanks. Uh, well, I'll just echo the, the bit about parking. I think that we need to take a second look here because it is short of parking right now, and I don't think an additional form will correct that situation. We've got some issues with the local uh, cultural groups, Buzzies Art and stuff like that, and they're, they're using the parking across the road as well, so it's not just the park users that are, are dealing with this. Um, you mentioned about festivals and being held there in the concession stand. Have you dealt with any of the groups that are putting on festivals down there and see what they're... Yes, um, th they were part of our uh, community advisory group, and so they were involved in it. Uh, plus, as part of, uh, prior to this, uh, I had some involvement in uh, doing configurations for the Francophone Village and things of that nature. So we have explored that, and we actually have done um, a, a plan up that shows where the tents could be located. So I'm thinking specifically of the festival to walk, that's one of the bigger festivals down there. You've talked to the people to organize that there. And yes. Okay, yes. excellent. Um, I'm glad to see the skateboard park is still in there. I was concerned that that was going to be taken away with, with all the other things we're trying to put in there. So, um, uh, and I agree with Councillor Reed. I added down here as well that we need to look at our, our other service organizations, Kinsman Lions, whatever, and see if we can get them involved. So, thank you. Thank you. Linda? Uh, thank you very much. Um, this looks uh, fabulous to me. Um, there's uh, an awful lot here, and I too am pleased uh, to see uh, the skateboard park. Can you just uh, flick me back to the first uh, slide, please? Thank you. Um, with respect to the parking, I, I agree with, with the concerns there. Um, I, I'm just looking down at the uh, southwest tip of the park. 
Um, and I'm wondering if, is there any room in there for parking? Um, and in, in that new entry that you've got down on the southeast, um, it, what specifically is that? Uh, we only have one access off King Edward for the parking lot that's uh, in this general area here, the new one that there's being built as part of the King Edward uh, widening. All the other accesses are pedestrian only. Okay, okay. See, see what I was wondering if, if that new entry down in the southeast corner, uh, if, if there was some way it could be a road and just take you over to that southwest tip and just add a little, par a little bit of parking down there. That was just an idea yeah. by looking at this. It's very, very tight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Selene, you have another question? Yeah, I, I, had, I had one question and then I had a cheeky comment. So I'll start with a cheeky comment. I'm sure we don't want a dog park down in here too? But anyway, <laughs> take off tail, it's just cheeky. Um, picking up on what Councillor Reed and Councillor Lynch were sort of talking about in terms of other service groups that are around and, and if I recall that our, the community gardens often have wait lists for, um, res, for, for plots to come available and I'm wondering if the display gardens for example, um, it, it, you know, was that something that, w that had been considered is that th that could be a community garden and let the community come and take care of this and sign up and I mean they're beautiful to walk through rather than the city doing that and just wanted to know if that had been part of the conversation. It, it didn't come up in our, uh, uh, any of our uh, user groups that uh, uh, it wasn't one of the issues that was brought up. It would be interesting to hear from our community gardens, either at Colony Farms or um, the one that's over by the cemetery, um, the Berquitlam group, if there is a demand and that, that might be the perfect opportunity. The Rose Society. Or the Rose Society or any of those other gardening societies might want to take it on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I, I would just comment that uh, your question is not really facetious, Selena, because every park is a dog park sometime or another. Mm -hmm. I noticed that we say a future report will detail projected capital associated operating costs and outline potential phasing. And I think phasing is something that we're going to have to look at, looking at these kinds of capital costs. And I hope the report will suggest how we can phase it, both in terms of capital and in terms of operating, trying to keep costs in line as we move forward. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Very good uh, presentation. Thank you. So the staff recommendation is that Council endorse the Mackin Park concept plan and two, that Council approve the next steps to advance the process which includes the development of a detailed design, cost estimates and the creation of a phased implementation plan. So moved. I'd, I'd like, I'll second it but I'd like an, to amend it to include the Disability Advisory Committee also as part of the, uh, the next steps. Absolutely. And you want to make that amendment? Making that amendment. No problem. Okay, and you, you seconded that? Um, and before we put this to a vote, I would also um, hope that, I don't think we need to put this in, uh, in the motion, but I would hope that we would ad keep looking at uh, new ways for uh, parking down there to address parking issues. So, all those in favor? The amended motion? Opposed? Unanimous. Item five is report of general manager parks, recreation and cultural services related to the off leash strategy city center area phase two. The staff recommendation is that council approve the establishment of an off leash area in Glen Park as outlined in the staff report and two that council approve the establishment of off leash hours in Coquitlam River Park as outlined in the staff report. So, um, I guess first off I'll say I'm not comfortable at all with off leash along the river and I won't be supporting that. Um, I don't think. I'm sorry. So do I have the floor? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, okay sorry. Um, so I, you know, we can have all the signage we want, but the last time I checked, dogs don't read very well, especially off leash ones. Um, so I'm, I'm just not comfortable designating um, these riparian areas as for off leash at all. Um, so I'm just not going to support that option and I would hope that the rest of this committee won't either. Um, one of the other challenges, so there's a couple other challenges I have. 
this was actually a very small number of respondents, and I don't know if staff was quite surprised, but I'm, I'm like, what? Like, how is it that we've got this small number of folks? So that concerns me. So, you know, that a small number of very vocal folks are moving us in a direction. Um, and then it, asks, then it gets me thinking, well, maybe, we don't, maybe there isn't demand for this. Maybe we're creating something that, that really, there, if there's no demand, then why would we be spending the money? Although I hunch that there probably is demand. So where are all these people who are skimming for more off-leash areas? Um, the other question I have is the overall vision for Glen Park. And so if we're, if we're being asked to take a piece and turn it into a dog park without having a better sense of what else is going to be there, it feels premature for me. Um, so I'm not, I'm not comfortable at this point with either, only because I don't really have a sense of, well, what's the bigger picture? Um, the other thing that sort of I've been paying attention to in, um, is how much money dog parks cost. And, um, and I appreciate that this isn't about um, this isn't about, um, I, I believe that turning parks into something u usable like this does cost money, I have no doubt. But I look at Hume Park and their off-leash is just a fence around a ball field and it's circular. And you take your dog off-leash and the dog does laps and the person walks, the dog socializes, and it doesn't take up a huge amount of land. It's not pretty, it's not the Cadillac, it's the Toyota Corolla uh, base model of off-leash dog parks, and we, we have a Cadillac, and um, I ride my bike past there quite frequently, and it's not well used. And I kept thinking, well, maybe it's the summer, maybe in the winter it'll be different. It's not. So I'm not completely enamored with spending a whole lot of money for, you know, yes, people are demanding it, but they're not using it. So to build something without really having good, a good sense of how many users will come out and use it, when maybe what they will use and, 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 and make use of is really a base model, fenced area that goes around, a, a sports field of some kind that gets used by the public very, very well, and then the dogs can run circles and go ahead and the and the folks can walk around or not and just watch their dog or watch their kid play and their dog run around, I don't, I, however they do that. But it starts to feel a little bit like we're doing a little bit more than maybe we ought to. So I'm, I'm not thrilled. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Robinson brought up a point, uh, perhaps you could speak or address. Um, Along the, the river there, uh, where the sensitive riparian areas are especially, was there any plan to, to, uh, to keep those in mind or to protect those? Uh, yes, the um, issue about recommending the, uh, the river trail is that we know that th currently there's a lot of this use right now, non-permitted use, and it is creating conflicts and it is exposing mm -hmm. the uh, sensitive areas to um, trampling and, and dog behavior. So the uh, treatment that staff recommend would be to legitimize what we know is happening already and to manage it by having specific hours where it is permitted and to be fencing off the environmentally sensitive areas, uh, the spawning rearing areas, um, so that they are protected from both humans going into those areas um, and most particularly off-leash dogs. So it would provide a higher level of protection than we currently have right now. And uh, our experience is that we are not getting compliance from the public on that Coquitlam River Trail and the efforts of our bylaw enforcement to educate and uh, seek compliance is not proving uh, to be making that much of a difference. So. Uh, again, we think that it is important to protect the habitat there and uh, we, we recommend doing that with dogs and we believe that uh, trying to actually allow an activity that it's already happening um, has a better chance of uh, success for compliance and we won't have the same kind of user conflicts that we're experiencing right now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> you know, dog parks are badly needed in Coquitlam. Let's not kid ourselves. We're very underbuilt as far as dog parks are concerned. <clears throat> the one in Riverview, or the one under in Monday Park under the power lines, that's the problem. And it's under power lines. I hear from a lot of people will not take their dogs there because under the power line. 
and I think we should have thought about that. <coughs> However, you know, I noticed that here at Coquitlam River Park, that's the first time I'm hearing of Coquitlam River Park, I thought it was going to be Nacabee Park uh, uh, by the Portman Bridge. That was going to be the second place that uh, we we're going to build a dog park in there that was ideal. Big parking lot, uh, certainly waterfront, and everything else that would be ideal. Uh, the, I don't know that I'd want to support the Coquitlam River Park, you know, uh, River Park for uh, off-leash dog park. In, in Glen Park, I think we had a plan of what is going to be in, in Glen Park. Not build a dog park and then here's a master plan for Glen Park and it's going to change it all together. That, and that's the problem that I'm having to make yeah. decisions. If I'm going to make decisions, I need all the facts and figures in front of me. Do I think that our doggy parks are too expensive? Of course they are. Whatever we do in a city seems to be Cadillac, Cadillac, Cadillac. You know, everything's gonna be very, very expensive. It's taxpayers' money, and I think we need to look at it. What is a bare minimum that we can do? Why does a fence have to cost $80,000 for, for a dog park? I, I fail to believe that. There's many other things that I fail to believe that, you know, Doggy parks have to be that expensive. People want their, their dogs to be able to run freely. They don't care whether it's $80 fence, $80,000 fence, or it's a $10,000 fence. They just want to be able to have their dogs run. But I've noticed that whatever we do in the city, even, even the, in, the, in our, in our uh, previous uh, presentation on Mackin Park, it's a Cadillac, Cadillac, Cadillac. And, you know, just move buildings around, demolish buildings, put new ones up, and a few other things. And those are the things that we have to be very, very careful about, it, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. I think the taxpayers are up to here with taxes. Okay? Thank you. Thanks, Lou. Neil? Yeah. Thank you. When I first put my hand up, I was going to say let's separate these items because I, I think they deserve to be treated distinctly. I'm entirely on side with Councillor Robinson. I don't see any permitted dog use in Coquitlam River Park. The fact that people do use it uh, to allow it because we can't prevent it doesn't seem to me to be the right way to go. If there's need to protect some of the riparian areas, whether from dogs or people, that's a different issue and something that we should be looking at. But I don't see just allowing some hours of permission <coughs> For people to do what when they're doing what they're not supposed to be doing as far as Glen Park goes I think let's do the master plan let's what is the plan for Glen Park how does this fit in with it that's the time to make the decision about what to do in Glen Park certainly from the the responses to our request for public input we don't have great numbers of people crying out for places to take their dogs in town city center if this decision a decision to defer the, de the Glen Park decision and not allow Coquitlam River Park. That recommendation <laughs> goes forward to Council. Council supports the recommendation and we find we have 150 emails the following Tuesday. Then we'll know that there is some demand out there. But right now, we don't know that. Thank you. Okay. Well, as the designated doggy person, um, I am disappointed to hear that there's that many off-leash uh, running along the river trail. I'm not surprised, but I'm disappointed. Um, it doesn't matter where I go in Coquitlam, there are off-leash dogs, and I'm walking along with mine, and I have one, he can be a really miserable SOB, so he's always, always leashed and close to me when other dogs pass. But I'll say to people, don't you understand this is a park? Hoy Creek Trail, there's a perfect one. And, um, well, what's your problem? Dogs weren't born with leashes on, you know? Well, maybe they weren't. But in parks, they definitely have to have leashes on. As far as Glen Park goes, I think this is a really bad idea right now. Um, we, we don't know what we want to do with Glen Park. And if we want to make a small area there for people to have dogs, I still think it should be linear or around some facility. And Councillor Robinson and I have had this discussion about the one in New West, and it works really well around a baseball 
diamond, the, the guys come in, they go to practice, they throw the dog in the run, and it has fun chasing its tail or whatever else is in there. And then they pick them up after they go, and everybody gets exercise. Um, when you go around Lafarge Lake, which isn't too far from this area, there's lots of people. And there again, you have someone running these little tiny dogs, they're little tiny cute furry fuzzy things, and they come running up to a Rottweiler or a pit bull or a German Shepherd and wonder why they get bit. Well, they look like toys running around the place. What, what sensible dog isn't going to bite it? I mean, you know, it looks like something, oh wow, here comes something for me to play with. So people, it, it's, not, it's not the dogs that are the problem, it's the owners that are the problem. And they need to learn to keep their dogs leashed when they're in our parks and we wouldn't be having half the problems that we are. What you're experiencing now when you draw a connection to the Coquitlam River Trail in Mundy Park, I mean, Councillor Lynch has been telling us for years, no matter if you run or bike or whatever in there, there's off-leash dogs. I've been called everything under the sun because I tell people to leash up their dogs. And it's just foolish. So I, I, won't, I don't support either of these right now. I think we need to get a plan for Glen Park. It's only two more blocks to Lafarge Lake to walk your dog. Leashes are not an expensive item. And as far as the Coquitlam River Trail goes, if they're not supposed to be um, off leash in there, ticket them and sit in there and ticket and ticket and ticket and ticket until we make a million dollars and somebody actually catches on. And I might add that you could go to Hoy Creek Trail. You can go to any place in Coquitlam, back into Mundy Park. And just for you, Mr. Chair, I had already asked at one point if we didn't have ATVs that the animal shelter and bylaw officers could be using to go into these areas, go up and down, and start ticketing folks. Because we can't solve all the problems by just building another one. And to do with the one that Lou says it's under, yeah, it's under the power line, but we also have parks all over the city under the power lines, and it's the same thing. So, I mean, I walk mine under the power line on the grind from Guilford to Lansdowne. <laughs> but it's, it's also there, and it's on a rainy day, and you, you get shocks. So there's no doubt about it, and we knew that going in. But I think your committee here also entertained putting bike trails or something in under there not too long ago too, which I brought up the same factor. So $80,000 is too much right now to be spending. When we have a beautiful new one up there, we have one at Bramble, we have lots of places. So I'm just saying back off till we finish Glen Park plan. That would be my suggestion. Okay. Uh, Selena? Um, I'd actually like to um, defer um, this decision, uh, particularly around Glen Park, the, the recommendation number one, until we have a master plan, until we have a, a vision of um, of what that park will entail. And it may entail a do an off-leash dog park. It may very well, but it, certainly what I've heard it's from this committee. That. Well, further along to what Neil said, why don't we separate these two? Yeah. And uh, so what we'll do... Uh, separate? Ms. Laura, did you catch that yeah, one? They can be easily separated. Great. So you've got a recommendation? Yeah, my recommendation is that we uh, defer recommendation number one until after we've uh, seen a, a, a vision for the park, the entire park. Second. And it's seconded. Is there any... Um, in there? It, no, I, obviously I, I don't have a vote because I'm not on the committee, but I would like to know if we're deferring this until we have that plan, what is the expected timeline of that plan? Uh, staff are actively working on that master plan now, and I'll uh, ask our park planner, Y. Sue Louie, if she has a timetable for that report. Early next year. That's reasonable. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, nothing further on, the, on this? Okay. Um, all those in favor of deferral on re recommendation number one? Opposed? Unanimous. The second one. What do we think about Riverside here? Motion, I'll move a motion to reject that. Reject it? Second. Uh, well, so, so I, I have some questions, Mr. Okay. Chair. So um, what's come, clearly what's come to light is that people are using it, and uh, Councillor Reed certainly talked about ticket, ticket, ticket. 
And I'm wondering if we need a, um, a bit of a better strategy. Do we need to spend some money putting up signage, uh, putting in fencing? Because that's part of what this plan was, that we're going to put in fencing um, to keep people out. Um, and if, 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 is that what we need to do? And will it work? Will it keep people out of the river um, in combination with extra ticketing, more, more bylaw presence? So. Uh, and, and you know, further along that line, I, it was the same. It was the same issue I thought during our RAR SPR talks there a couple of years ago, inviting people into riparian areas, and especially sensitive ones. And I like what's in this report, how, and I don't want to lose this on not only keeping dogs out of the sensitive but areas, people. but keeping humans out of yes, there as well, exactly. because we've invited people in along. The river there by building these trails, but I think we haven't done our due diligence by keeping the sensitive areas. So I don't want to lose that either. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Well, what I was hoping we could, I, I see two things. First of all, I think there's clearly a will here on the committee to, to see more enforcement on the Coquitlam River Trail and probably Hoy Creek and anywhere else. But I guess that's not Ms. McKay's business. She's she doesn't have bylaw enforcement officers, so we'd have to direct somebody or send a direction somewhere else. And, and I think we should ask for a report that deals not with off-leash hours on the Coquitlam River Trail, but on protection of the riparian areas on the Coquitlam River Trail and what that would cost us, and whether there are other riparian areas that warrant similar protection. Uh, Mr. Dumont, would you um, care to speak to that? Uh, Ms. Parks, I think, would, would that comes under her purview, doesn't it? That, that is correct through the chair. Uh, I can certainly take the message back to uh, bylaw enforcement relative to uh, the committee's desire for increased enforcement, uh, and we can look at ways to do that and ways to control the access to the area. Thank you. Was well, there anyone else to speak on that? Oh, Barry, sorry. Well, I'm, I'm certainly not going to argue against, you know, take some steps to pro, to protect the, the riparian areas and the fencing and signage is all good. But what I will note is that in Monday Park, we have uh, fencing and signage staying, staying stay out of Lost Lake. And every day that I'm jogging in there, there's a dog <clears throat> or somebody playing in there. So yeah. it takes more than just signs and fencing. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So how do we, uh, how, how do we encompass this in the uh, recommendation number two? Just if you did. Yeah, defeat. So, so or with, with recommendations of. of Re uh, refer it to by. Refer it. Uh, I can't. I'd like well, to I think there's some direction to staff here, but then dealing with the, rec the recommendation that's before us is not one that we want to approve. Okay. So. Um, Just defeat it. Yeah, yeah, you know, in here, you know, Maccabee Park was a, was a discussion a year ago oh. uh, as far as one of the parks for, for off leash dog park. All of a sudden it's disappeared even not a suggestion on it. I wonder how come it disappeared and what for? Because of the work going on down there. Uh, through the chair, this work is specifically related to the town center area of the city. Council had um, approved a study to look at off-leash opportunities in the city center area. Uh, we brought a report to council that identified six potential sites just within the city center area. Those were narrowed down to these three sites. So the Maccabee is, uh, we haven't lost that uh, discussion, but that wasn't the subject of this particular area. Uh, I think council is sensitive to the fact that we've had lots of people move into this area. Many of them are dog owners, and there was some pressure to look at off-leash opportunities just in the city center. I understand what you're saying, but sure to God, there's, you know, we're looking for dog parks. We're looking all of Coquitlam, not the Coquitlam Center only, because you'll get squawks from other people. So when I'm saying that, you know what, do we need three more in Coquitlam Center, or do we need to spread them out a wee bit to where every part of the community is being looked after? That's why I'm mentioning Maccabee Park, okay? Oh, well. Very simple. Okay. Thank you. May? Maccabee Park already is an off-leash dog park, although it's not supposed to be. Everybody's dog is off-leash down there. And then they run along the trails right along the river and into Colony Farm. So we have the same problem there that we have on the Coquitlam River or that we have um, or that we have anywhere else. So, so Coquitlam's gone to the dogs, eh? Coquitlam's gone to the dogs, yeah. 
Okay, so then uh, do we have a motion? I ha I'll make a motion that that council not approve recommendation number two. That's why. Second. Okay. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Here's unanimous. And then for direction to staff that the committee would like to see more enforcement in these non-off leash areas. All right. Next. And, uh, and, and would like a report back on protection of the riparian areas. Yeah, that'll come. Costs back. and so forth. Yeah. We'll make sure that comes back in there. Thanks. Item six is report of General Manager Parks, Recreation and Culture Services related to the Noxious Weed Bylaw number 4181 2010. The staff recommendation is that Council give first, second, and third readings to the City of Coquitlam Noxious Weed Bylaw. So moved. A second, and I'd like to speak to it. Go ahead. The, I'm used to someone else getting in ahead of me, so I wasn't. <laughs> Under five in the bylaw itself, notice of non-compliance on identification or observation that an officer, employee, or agent may require the owner or occupier to clear the real property within the time frame specified in the notice. I'm, completely uncomfortable with passing a bylaw that doesn't provide for how much time we're going to allow people. It would appear that somebody is going to decide as they print the notice that's going to be used whether you're going to get 24 hours or 72 hours or six weeks. And I think the bylaw should specify the amount of time that will allow a person from notice to clear their property of noxious weeds. Do we have a Mr. Anglin, can you have an idea of what or? that time period might be? <clears throat> sure, through the chair. I think um, that that clause um, is used in some of our other bylaws without that don't actually specify that time period. It would just allow more flexibility. We've found sites where um, there's one or two plants in somebody's yard versus um, a large infestation, and it's reasonable to give people more time to uh, deal with a larger infestation. So. Um, that's essentially the, the reasoning there, and it's, it's not um, precedent setting. There are other bylaws that have that clause that doesn't specify the time period. Uh, I, I appreciate the intention, but I'm left with the discomfort that you know, this is, feels a little bit like all the furor around right now about zero five and whether who, who's the judge, jury, and executioner. Uh, we're the people who need to make these decisions and I think we need to set a time period. I don't think there's any question, but that staff would have the latitude to allow some flexibility. If we were to say 14 days uh, and somebody had an immense infestation or there was two feet of snow on the ground and you couldn't get a crew into work, then the question becomes at what point when they're in violation do you pursue it further? And I think that's where staff would use their judgment. But I would much prefer to see an actual time period specified in the bylaw. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I understand what uh, Council Nicholson is saying. He's correct. The fact is that, you know, I had even calls here the other day where a people have gone away on holidays for two weeks holidays, and when they come back, they got four or five tickets in, in their uh, mailbox, see, without really finding out whether the residence is at home or not, whether the residence is there. <clears throat> and you're right, the fact is that if somebody wants to go ahead and start writing tickets, even if it's 14 days, writing tickets every couple days, and then by the time the person gets back, could have seven tickets in his mailbox. I think that's something that we need to address is it was the person home and the bylaw officer should speak to him directly and give him the 14 days or whatever this council deems it to be appropriate. But just to draw up a bylaw that's going to be at the whim of any bylaw enforcement officer, I'm not prepared to support that. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else? Well, what, what I'm hearing is we can, we can pass this recommendation through, but we could put in an addition. Yeah. That, that when it comes to council, there'd be a recommendation as to a time period. Sure. 
Um, and we'll get staff to be able so to come we'll, back what, yeah. what they think is a reasonable time. Do we have a second for so that? We've got okay. Any further discussion on this issue? All those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Item 7 is Report of General Manager, Parks, Recreation and Cultural Services related to the Cultural Capitals of Canada. Final report, we have an introduction by our General Manager, Parks, Recreation and Cultural Services. Uh, yes, we have a brief, a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, here that highlights the legacies uh, from our participation mm -hmm. as a designated cultural capital of uh, Canada City. Uh, that presentation is going to be given by uh, Linda Baker, our Community Events Coordinator. Linda. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, so the legacy of Coquitlam's Cultural Capitals Canada program, it began, began in 2006 with 22 stakeholders and five groups getting together to decide what they wanted to see as our program. When we had the successful grant approved, we had five projects, the Meardville Centennial, the uh, Coquitlam Canoe Project, the, um, which, sorry, and the three festivals, the BC Highland Games, the Korean Festival, and the Canada Day. So there's, oh, am I, I'm you bouncing You want me to do this. it? I can do it if you prefer. So there are 10 legacies that came out of the Cultural Capitals Program, so I'm just going to briefly go over those. The first time is MOA, <laughs> the full-time position as the Community Events Coordinator. The second is the Cultural Strategic Plan, and this plan focuses on the areas of celebration, sustainability, connections, leadership, and visibility. The third is the public art um, program. So in June 2010, a public art policy statement was approved by council and currently the work is being done on creating a public art program plan. The fourth is the very, very important name change of the department to Coquitlam Parks Recreation and Culture. The fifth is the venue development. And there are several venues that events um, take place that small things are being done to improve the venues for events. Um, the big one that we saw earlier is the Mackin Park redesign. The new um, parking lot that was being developed just with the road widening will make a great area for shuttle bus coming into the park so that there will be less um, event parking needed right in the, in the park. Lafarge Lake is um, hopefully getting a new a power kiosk in the future. Um, the creation of the Spirit Square stage is a great um, opportunity for cultural activities. Um, Blue Mountain Park, very small changes like taking the tennis court panels out and, um, or changing the, the, the fencing to have panels so that when we have festivals and they need to have the fence removed for the festivals, it's easier and less expensive for staff to do that. Um, increased opportunities for local and professional artists. The fact that we're doing Canada Day is a huge um, opportunity for local and professional artists to perform in this community. And also the Spirit Square stage is we get people asking us all the time, where can they perform? Um, increased opportunity for lo local residents in planning. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention here is the Festival Planners Network, which was started in 2004, but the Cultural Capitals Program really revitalized that network. We've had increased attendance with more um, diverse cultural groups attending. And they have itinerary items that include greening their events. They're very interested in garbage um, and how to um, deal with garbage at events and make that better. We just met with Metro Vancouver as a group and went over how, how things like that can happen. Um, the other thing that they talked about is the need to create some plans in case there was a huge disaster that happened. One of the events, none of us has ever really thought about that, none of the organizers have thought what happens if the earthquake hits. So they're all very interested in talking about that and learning more things. The seventh is increased opportunity for residents in planning and I think Canada Day, um, the diverse cultural activities are really a big opportunity here with the Fry City uh, Iranian group doing the Megaran Festival as their first attempt. 
and uh, the Caribbean community is really looking to bring in a Caribbean celebration. And um, you'll see one small one that will be happening in the winter of 2011. And the eighth is um, residents participation. And just with the increased um, opportunities for cultural events, more and more residents are getting involved. And uh, we're really happy that uh, Evergreen and um, Theatrix has partnered together to bring a theater, a provincial-wide theater festival to the city. Um, the ninth one is development of strategic par partnerships within the cultural area. And the first one is in the private sector with sponsorship. And we started um, a sponsorship program, small sponsorship program last year in Canada Day, and we hope to improve that with a little bit more time next year. And the fact that we did Taste of a Coquitlam and just didn't order in vendors to get the businesses engaged in their community, and they, uh, we get really good response from them. And um, through Canada Day, uh, the marketplace, we had a few small businesses. What we learned from the sponsorship program is that businesses wanted to come on board. They wanted to be on site. And so we can see if we'd go forward with another Canada Day, a community marketplace happening. Volunteer organizations. One of the new partnerships that we've been creating is the Scouts. Um, they did come to the presentation at the Festival Planners Network, and they're very interested in um, continuing with their environmental badge and getting involved with the recycling and the garbage that happening at local events. Cultural organizations and the school district uh, 43 of all um, being involved with new new cultural activities, the one that will be coming up early in January, the new diversity art project that, that Pine Tree has done for the City Hall. And the First Nations are, uh, Evergreen's working with the Coquitlam First Nations to do an exhibit in 2011, 11 First Nations exhibit, so we're very excited about that too. The 10th um, legacy is the city staff event team. We've um, been pulling together all the departments and the staff uh, in the city to come together around local festivals and events to uh, work together as a team to make it, make it easier for festivals and events to happen in the city. And that ends my presentation. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Great presentation. The, the one comment that you made about Mac and Park that the uh, uh, there, there would be a spot for a shuttle bus, so you don't need to have the parking. You know, we may think that way. You know, uh, and I hope it was that way, but it doesn't work out that way. The fact is that you know, uh, shuttle buses don't accom uh, you know accommodate everybody to their time frame and a few other things for many reasons. So <clears throat> that's one that I really disagree. That we kind of put shuttle buses and take out all the parking. I, it just doesn't work. Thank you. Yeah, um, I want to thank you actually for particularly the, the, these, these 10 legacy statements because I think those are the outcomes that we're looking for, certainly that I'm looking for. It's like, so we had this great, we had this pile of money and we did all these great things, but are we different as a result of this experience? And I think this is sort of bang on. Like just looking at this last one, that we have an event team, we have now a model going forward on what we need to do, who needs to talk to whom, that will that makes us more efficient as a city that provides better service to the taxpayers as a result of being a cultural capital and I, so so I thank you very much for sort of what I would call sort of the outcome data in terms of how are we different um, I think it's really important that we continue to bring that that kind of stuff forward because as a city councilor then I, I feel comfortable sort of defending those decisions because I say because we are benefiting and I can detail exactly how we are benefiting and how we are a better city as a result so thank you very much for bringing these forward I'm wondering if we could get maybe just a, a memo with these sorts of things so that I have that in my back pocket certainly thank you thank you Linda. any other questions no I think that's it no. thank, you. thank you very much uh, move receipt Move it. Seconded it. All those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. The next recommendation are the that the committee receive the minutes of the Sports Council meeting held Wednesday, November 3rd, 2010. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. That concludes the items on the formal agenda. Anything around the table?
Adjourned. Adjourned. Second. All those in favor, we're out of here. We're out of here. Thank you.